What is neurodiversity? What is it about these people? Dyslexia. Autism spectrum. ADHD. Gifted. Dysgraphia. All brains are different. It's okay to be who you are. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Episode 86. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, the author of Teaching Twice Exceptional Students in Today's Classroom and Raising Twice Exceptional Children, a Handbook for Parents of Neurodivergent Gifted Kids. Today's episode features Mark Hess sharing about the topics he thinks are essential to support bright learners' social and emotional development. First, a quick invitation for you to come on over and join the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group over on Facebook. We've got a lot of great conversations going on, and recently we've begun crowdsourcing questions from our group members for a special Q&A for our guests. I'm really excited to share those with you that we've already created. And if you want to have your questions featured in one of those Q&A sessions, be sure to join the group. Of course, you can also follow us on other social media platforms. We're the Neurodiversity Podcast on Instagram or at NeurodiversePod on Twitter. Up next. Hi, I'm Mark Hess. I'm in my 33rd year of public education, the last 22 specifically with gifted kids. I'm the president-elect of the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented and a board member for supporting the emotional needs of the gifted. Stay right there. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. I'm not a non-autistic person with a side of autism (laughs) that can be treated or wished away or rewarded or punished away. I am a completely autistic person. Autism is central to my being. But the thing is, me saying I am autistic is a reclamation of something that ended up being used as a slur or something that was negative. And it's important for the stigma and the shame to be taken away from that. That's episode 85. Look for it in your favorite podcast app. I'm happy to welcome Mark Hess to the podcast today. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my honor. I am a fan already, and so it's a lot of fun that I get to be on the show now, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've worked and supported gifted learners for a lot of your career, which is where I started my career as well. And recently, you have published some books through Proofrock that are specifically a social and emotional curriculum for gifted kids. Do you want to talk just a couple of minutes about what made you feel like there needed to be something new out there for people to use? Well, it's one of those areas that people are always struggling to figure out, how am I going to deliver these social emotional lessons? And a lot of times I think people just go right to the discussion. In a perfect world, we would have these students all the time. But unfortunately, a lot of gifted resource teachers might only see a student for an hour at a time in a week. It's almost embarrassing to say, right? Uh, or it might be up to a few hours. And so unless you're teaching in a full immersion situation, you only have so much time to deliver all of these important understandings that you want to help deliver and provide all of these experiences that you want to provide. And so I wanted to integrate highly creative, engaging lessons with social emotional understandings. And so it's not something that I is new to me. It's something I've been doing for years and years. And so these three books, there's a third grade curriculum, a fourth grade curriculum, and a fifth grade curriculum. And they're the product of probably 12 years of working through lessons with students. And they're just all, they're kid tested. And as you know, with gifted learners, so many times, like they come up with what you're going to do next. You didn't even expect it to go in that, in that direction. And so they're beautiful in that way. And so they're all tried and tested and I just, it's time to share them with people. And so it was, it was really a process of uh, writing them much more carefully than I had written them for myself, <laughs> right? And and going through the editing process and, and the proposal process and all those things that go along with publishing. What is it about your experiences that reinforce the belief that social and emotional needs of high ability kids need specific support? Yeah. That is, you know, different than maybe what their their other classmates might have. It really goes to how I experience the gifted world as an adult and how other adults who are gifted experience it too. I don't know how many times in my career that I've been talking to a parent or someone had said, you know, what do you do? I I teach gifted kids. 
And the response would be, oh, I used to be gifted. I used to be gifted. (laughs) And it's almost said like guiltily. It's almost said like, oh, it's just a joke. Don't take this seriously. Or sometimes it's said with a sort of a smile, like I remember some really good experiences and being in some cool groups that I used to be in. But it's that process of so many under, so many times coming through uh, an entire school system without really understanding what giftedness is, and if indeed you are a gifted learner. And uh, I am a part of this Facebook group, this for gifted adults. And some of the responses on there just they literally break my heart. They're devastating. I mean, to the point where last week I just got on there and and I. I wrote a response, as you said, I've been teaching gifted kids for a long, long time. And I just want to tell everybody I love you. And it's just, it's that devastation that something has been missing and some understandings have been missing. I was one time having an advanced learning plan meeting with parents and a fourth grade boy. He was new to the school. And I said, you know, how's it going? It's going pretty good, except for that brain thing. It's like, what are you talking about? that brain thing. And he kind of looks at his mom. They've had this conversation before, obviously. He kind of looks to her and she's like, explain. I said, well, I guess I've got a problem with my brain. This boy in my class told me that I've got a problem with my brain. And it's one of those things that a fourth grade boy would say to another fourth grade boy, like instead of throwing rocks, they're throwing words, right? But it's not a sticks and stones will break my bones and names will never hurt me situation for this kid. He's full of emotional intensities and this has gone right to his heart and he can't let go of it, nor will he let go of it and he won't fire back. And he's internalized this, there's something wrong with me and he's going to believe his fourth grade classmate instead of his parents or his teachers and people who are explaining otherwise and talking about all these different situations about why people use cut downs, it's it's just gone to his heart. And I think it's that kind of situation that starts the process of going underground. And especially about that age, about fourth grade, fifth grade, this process starts. I see it with girls, especially by fifth grade. And then I taught middle school for a number of years, gifted, specifically gifted. And I would get these wonderful, exuberant sixth grade leader girls entering my program. And they would just get quieter and quieter and quiet oftentimes as those years went on. And I would get the boys who just became cooler and cooler and really cool (laughs) by the time they were done. And... You know, in my room, they were still the gifted kid because that's who we all were together. But out in the hallways and around the lockers and on the athletic fields, that was not their identity. So, yeah, there's a long answer to that. Why do I think that's so important? I I think that giftedness is an outlier. And as an outlier, it takes a special attention, social emotional programming that you can't get from, you know, it's very popular right now. Social emotional learning is very popular in K-12, but not specifically for gifted. That's my job. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fill those shoes. I'm going to be, I'm going to be that person who tells you you're okay. There is definitely a greater awareness of social and emotional needs overall. I, I agree with your, with your observation there. I would also say not only is there not so much of a emphasis on social emotional for gifted, but I think Gifted education right now is under fire in a lot of ways, just kind of in general. And I'm always wondering how that is then influencing the kids who are in those programs. Are they aware of that? Or is that is that bias from other educators or from other adults? Or how do they internalize that? That's kind of almost like the where you're talking about those adults who are saying, oh, I was in a gifted program once. It's like they've internalized this message that that's something to be ashamed of in some way. Yeah. And it really evolves with the ages, too, because, I mean, the, and I think that's something that elementary school kids are definitely not aware of, from my experience. But as kids get older, they're aware of this otherness. Um, but the more common, the more common sort of response I get from the elementary school is, you know, I'm out on recess duty and uh, a child comes up, this, you know, this lovely kid comes up and says, you know, Mr. Hess, why can't I be in your class? 
And there's these moments where it's like, how do I explain this? What do I say that they want to, because we're doing cool stuff. And we're doing very, very challenging thing. And I can't go into the gifted resource teacher's professional development explanation of why you're not in my class. So I think in elementary school that there's not that stigma, that it's it's a celebration, but that it transforms over the years to eventually being the adult who apologizes for I used to be gifted. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the topics that you address in the curriculum, the ones that you distilled and chose as the most important things that you felt like kids maybe would benefit from. And one of those is is perfectionism. And I know that that gets a lot of hype. What what are some of the ways that you've seen perfectionism show up in high ability students? One of them I call surfing the wave of wonderfulness. This is another conversation about an advanced learning plan where all these things come up because I've got, I've got two generations. Because I'm talking to the parents who are most likely gifted themselves, and I've got their kid, and we've got this wonderful circle of insight going. The parents of and, and their daughter come in. It's just this wonderfully high-achieving, do-anything-you-ask-of-her girl, whatever you want to do, I'll try it at, a, at fourth grade now and at third grade at this point still. I'll try it. I'll give it a try in your class anyway. It's like, we want to rubber stamp this. Kid's great. Your kid's great. I love your kid. Yeah, we love her too. Okay, we'll see you. But, but I'm a little worried. And it's this wave of wonderfulness. You start riding high atop this wave. And because so oftentimes um, students are told from kindergarten on, oh, you're so smart. That is so easy for you. Oh, wow, you did that so fast. And as parents, we can easily fall into that same sort of response because we love our kids and we want to celebrate our kids. It's so easy to say those same sorts of things. And that becomes who they are. It becomes like if something is challenging and it took me a little longer than I needed to take on it or I couldn't quite understand it, now I have failed or I don't even try anymore. And I had a a parent in one of the Sang Model parent groups I was working with. Her daughter was a seventh grader in a cross country and she had never lost a race. And she was talking about her, her daughter's perfectionism. And during the race, it became obvious in about the last hundred yards that she was not going to win. And so she just fell down and laid on the ground, and just stopped. Similar to the way a gifted kid might come to a challenging part of the curriculum and just avoid it. And may have a 4.5 thousand GPA when they graduate high school, but still may never have really taken a challenge that was something that would take that extra extra, extra. They'll do extra. Gifted kids might oftentimes do that extra. They do all these wonderful things, but they're doing it out of pleasure oftentimes instead of out of that, out of that ultimate sort of challenge position. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it looks like underachievement too, some of that avoidance. But riding that wave, you know, when you fall off that wave, it, uh, it doesn't feel so good and you don't want to get back on there. And so, you know, do you even want to dip your toe in the water anymore? Do you want to get back up on that wave and maybe fall down and have your entire identity questioned in your mind as a perfectionist? So, yeah, that's I think that's so often a key component to gifted kids and just the way they interact with the school system. Uh, Not so much at home, because that's the safe place where you can do all of those things without getting a grade for them or without having to fill out a rubric at the end or write an essay response. They're doing all these secret projects, not necessarily secret, but all of these passion projects, they're doing them at home Mm -hmm. on their own. One of the activities that I noticed that you had included in in one of the books about perfectionism was about um, an activity about giving kids permission to be perfectionists. Yeah, perfectionism pass. I think that's what it was called. Um, Uh, Literally a certificate you got. Yeah. Talk about that for a minute. I think the other part of that certificate, it says something like, we understand that you want to do really well. And we understand that you care about what people think of you. And so we're giving you permission to be that person. Mm. And the other part that's not on there is it you know, maybe you could turn it over. It's not there, but you could turn it over and say, and, and we love you very much, you know, if it's mom and dad. I wish all of us perfectionists could know that we're not letting somebody down, mm-hmm. you know, that we're loved for who we are. 
Yeah, I liked that because the activity, because it kind of also just normalized it. Like it's okay to have that, you know, emotion. And it comes from a place of self-understanding, which I think is key for emotional regulation just in general. If you can kind of understand like, why is it that I feel like I want to do this or why, what are some of the benefits? It can be both sides. It doesn't always have to be a negative. Yeah. I also really liked that you chose to address empathy and global awareness as one of the topics, because I feel like that while perfectionism is something that we often see addressed related to gifted kids, I don't think we notice people talking about empathy and especially global awareness quite so much. Why do you feel like that is a topic that's really important for gifted kids? Because if you're in Generation Z, the world is at your fingertips. And we're beyond Generation Z, by the way. Our gen- our youngest Generation Z kids are like third graders now. Mm-hmm. But that world is at your fingertips. You're connected virtually and even more so, even I think ironically, in a pandemic year, we can be even more connected at a distance than we used to be because we have tools we did not use before. One of the beautiful things about gifted kids is, and really what transformed my thinking about when I was first a gifted teacher, I was all about the projects. I wanted to do creative projects, engaging projects. How can we challenge these kids? You know, we want to, we want to follow the passions and let's stretch the curriculum. Let's make all of their classroom teachers so thankful that they get to come down to my room and do all these really cool things and then, and do well on achievement tests and all these things. And none of those things are bad. Those are all good. But as time went by, it really became an understanding that gifted kids lead with their heart. They understand the viewpoints of other people at a young age. They're able to step into somebody else's situation and imagine another person's experience at a young age. And that's so beautiful about who they are, and especially as young kids. And that continues for a long time. Mm-hmm. The world starts to get in the way. You know, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, I start hearing kids. At first, they're probably parroting what they hear at home. And sometimes that is not the most accepting statements in the world, as we all know. And I just see this world starting to get in the way. And they've lost this sort of purity of acceptance of who they are. And I don't think we need to teach compassion. We can't really teach it. Yeah. We can allow understanding and we can encourage understanding and we can allow it to be cool to express empathy and to express compassion. I actually have a K through two curriculum for gifted kids. Mm. And one of the first lessons is about this book called Marshmallow. If you've ever seen it, 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 it's a wonderful picture book and it's about a bunny and a cat who become friends. And or just use this as a vehicle for understanding individual differences. And um, in, in that lesson, I have kids going out onto the internet and seeing pictures of kids from all over the world who very much do not look like them, at least in my school, and citing ways that those kids are just like them. You know, it's a cut and paste activity like with first graders. We're cutting out statements like um, their family loves them and you paste it next to it just all these compassionate statements that the kids at that age are so accepting of. We were doing that activity and I had a first grader and, you know, one of the statements was they love their family just like me. And a first grade boy, and I mean, this is like the most ornery, active first grade boy in the group. This is the kid, (laughs) this is the kid who's getting in trouble a lot. And one of my favorite kids too. And he just stops, he like interrupts me. It's like, Mr. Hess, Everybody loves their family. What are you thinking? You don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, and, but it was just so honest and sincere and so very true coming out of the, out of the lips of a six or seven-year-old. Yeah. One of the things that I notice sometimes when I'm talking with some of my older clients or when I think back on some of my middle school age students is this piece with the global awareness and the empathy but also feeling sometimes really like they have that connection, but they feel kind of helpless, that they don't have a way to really influence the world, like in a way that they feel like is making a difference in some way. Do you feel like that's something that you sometimes have seen? I feel that right now. (laughs) Yes. And uh, I think it's in the fifth grade book. I have a lesson called Saving the World. 
Interestingly enough, it's about the development of the polio vaccine. And this was way before pandemic years that this first came out. Most kids didn't even know what polio was. Mm. We start with the story of Jonas Salk and how he had developed the vaccine and then made it a gift to the world where he did not patent it. He did not get royalties from it. He wanted everybody to benefit from understanding this science. And we start with some empathy because we show pictures of kids wearing the leg braces. Now, when I was in school, there was always at least one kid with the polio leg braces. And so I'm just showing them pictures and pictures of polio treatment with children and pictures of some uh, of a girl getting vaccinated and, and having this like scream on her face. And we're going to engage them with their empathy already. And then we talk about Jonas Salk. And then we talk about how... If anybody could save the world, that might be as close as some one person could come. And that's uncommon in our history. Mm -hmm. And you can't save the world. But then we go back and we talk about big problems and engage in discussions about the biggest problems they can think of. And we talk about what we can do like right inside our school and what we can do locally to help save the world. Everybody can do these little things. And when we do them together, that's the next key point. And when a lot of people get together and do these things, and when people get together and they make organizations and they make nonprofits and they make companies that take care of other people and take care of and address these problems, then that's where the power is. So, you know, it's really a lesson about like, what can you do yourself and what can you do with others? Uh, so it's a lesson. It, it is a lesson about working together at the same time. And at the same time, it's a lesson about that global awareness. Mm -hmm. That problem doesn't stop in your school. It doesn't stop at your city limit. It doesn't stop at your state line. It, it goes far beyond that. One of the pieces of feedback that I get from teachers in gifted ed programs is that they aren't trained to be a school counselor, yet they feel like they're often placed in that role in some ways, maybe because they have those students for multiple years or the class sizes are smaller. What do you think is an appropriate way to view the role of a gifted education teacher related to that social and emotional development? Yeah. There's definitely kind of like one foot in each on each side of that. Where's where's the balance? People in my role are not counselors officially, but we are mm -hmm. at the same time. But I think we're also counselors for the professionals in our building, the colleagues that we have in our building. And I've been in several different schools and all of them for a number of years that over time, their relationships start to form with the school counselors and the school counselors start to understand gifted kids as gifted kids and not just a kid who's having some issues right now, but in a much broader way. And other teachers start to understand that too. And so you've really, I mean, you have this team of support, but I think a lot of that does fall back on the gifted resource teacher. I think there's a lot of responsibility in that role. And imagine if we had the sort of resources that other special programming had. Um, you know, imagine if we had a gifted resource teacher that just followed one kid all day, like sometimes we have in other special programs, like, you know, your job, like Ellen DeGeneres said she wanted a, someone to help her with her diet. She was going to hire someone that all they did was slap cookies out of her hand. <laughs> so, so what if the gifted kid just had someone who followed him around all that all day and slapped worksheets out of their hand and said, no, 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 that's not for you. Yeah. It's a tough role with with limited resources. It's a tough role. I mean, on the one hand, I feel like it's so easy that the kids do learn to trust you in that role. And so they do come to you. And I don't know. I, I just wish that that sometimes it is nice when you have a school counselor who can who really does understand. But the often they are spread so thin as well. Yeah. And, and highly biased being on the saying board. Uh, but I think that's one of the powerful things about saying is that there's a therapist community that is heavily involved in that organization. And that's a place where Colorado Gifted is trying to go to. It's like, we need all these people on board. We need as much understanding as we can have to help us out. And so if our resources are limited, well, let's step outside and let's bring in the counseling office and let's bring in principals too and, and assistant principals and let's bring everybody on board on this. It's a team effort to help everybody out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and 
But I just got to say, like middle schoolers, they they would come and just say sometimes very not nice things about other teachers mm-hmm. who do not understand them and just very <laughs> honest. But at the same time, it's like, okay, um, I understand you're saying this because you really trust me and you're not going to get in trouble for it. But it's all part of the beauty of building the relationships, though. Mm-hmm. And and I wouldn't say it comes at a cost. I think it's, I would say it comes as a privilege. Yeah, I agree. I know parents are always looking for ways to support their bright kids, and they might notice some of that asynchrony related to their intellectual ability compared to their emotional awareness or regulation skills. I think the Columbia Group defines, basically defines giftedness as asynchronous, and uh, it, it does get to the heart of it. And when you understand the asynchrony involved, you understand that a lot of that is also due to the intense and rich and complex way that gifted children live in this world. Mm -hmm. All right. So one last question, and um, I want to relate it to one of the other topics that you cover in your books, which is identity. If you were talking with one of your students who is struggling with their identity, either as just a gifted individual or just their own experiences, what would you say to them? What would you want that student to know? Somehow, I want them to understand that what they feel and oftentimes experience is different from the way others experience the world. They think about things that other kids their age do not. They make connections that others do not. They pinpoint injustices in a way that kids their age often cannot. They meet the world in a different way. And that way is neither good nor bad, but it's beautiful. It's who you are. And that as you go through life, you'll be writing a certain sort of personal poetry about the world. And it might be mathematical poetry, it might be and engineering poetry, and it might actually be writing poems. But I hope that you understand that it's that personal poetry about the world that is the most important thing to continue doing, to continue writing that story, and to continue understanding who you are, and to touch the lives of others around you in a way that is quite uncommon and wonderful at the same time. Mark, thank you so much for your time today. It's my pleasure. Whether we're talking about perfectionism, empathy, or self-advocacy, we don't want to forget that our bright kids won't always just figure it out on their own. We need to take the time to support their development through open conversations and activities that are designed to encourage the development of these really important soft skills. The long-term benefits of teaching these skills while kids are young are undeniable. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks to Mark Hess for his great conversation with Emily today. You can learn more about Mark at giftedlearners.org or check out the episode 86 page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to you for your generosity. Those of you who have chosen to contribute financially to our efforts via PayPal or Patreon. If you'd like to join them, click on support at the top of our website, neurodiversitypodcast.com. I'm executive producer Dave Morris. And for Emily, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.
This podcast is a production of Morris Creative Services.